Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014. Brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Welcome back to San Francisco, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's production of VMworld 2014. We're here at Moscone, Moscone South, right inside the lobby on the right-hand side. Stop by and see us. Abu, Kar, Abu Bakar Diare is here. Uh, he's with HP. He's a master technologist with HP. We're going we're gonna to geek out a little bit, um, talk about software-defined storage. Um, yeah, I'm going to start off, I, I said, Several years ago, I said, HP's got to get back to its roots of invent. Okay. It used to be in the logo. Right. Right? This is your wheelhouse. This right. is what you do. Right. You're right. part of that innovation team. So um, we're, we're seeing, we're hearing a lot of marketing around software defined everything. <laughs> um, so SDX, okay, and certainly it's plenty on software defined storage. Right. So how much of that is marketing? How much of that is innovation? So I wonder if you could talk about the innovation piece of that? Well, there is the, there's definitely a lot of innovation happening. I mean, and a lot, I know a lot of people have been talking software defined storage in general, and um, it's a big buzzword, and it's very difficult to understand. But from a technology side, there's actually quite a bit of work that we're doing to actually make that story true. Um, when you think software defined storage, you're thinking being able to um, provision and access storage capacity uh, you know, instantly. At least that's the way I think about it. And uh, I'd like to pretty much abstract hypervisor layers. Uh, I'd like to be agnostic to those things. Um, I'd like to be agnostic to uh, virtual machines possibly running on, a, on, a, on, a, on an operating system and serving storage. What I'd like to think about when I hear software defined storage is provision to me capacity, a storage pool that I can use now that also offers you data services uh, that are enterprise class, right? So being able to uh, enable snapshotting, replication, and those, all those uh, uh, you know, in, uh, enterprise level data services that you're used to. And so when you abstract all these things and you think about software defined storage just as being able to provision capacity quickly, rapidly, and make it cost effective, uh, that's where a lot of the technology to enable all those things comes from, right? Okay, so when, when I, when, when, and from a product standpoint, that's the, the virtual storage array, VSA. Right. Right. Um, Talk more about the technology behind that. So you just, you just described what it enables you to do. Right. Essentially, it simplifies provisioning That's and correct. management. That's correct. Um, but it also includes a rich stack, which is, I guess that stack has always been software. Exactly. You know, quote unquote. Exactly. So what's the enabler there? Is it just a lot of coding, uh, a lot <laughs> of testing? You know, what's the technology A little, little bit of both. Um, so basically, you, you, you look at a VSA and you know, it's pretty much essentially a virtual machine. Um, you can think about it as like an I.O. controller right, that you put on a, any hypervisor that you want. One of the key things for us is uh, making sure that we're hypervisor agnostic, which is why we're enabling uh, KVM support uh, coming up here soon. Right? That's one of our technology enhancements. And so now you can run your VSA on any flavor of KVM. Uh, initially, our initial support for KVM is going to be focused on Helion. I know you and Vish were just talking in your previous segment, we were just talking about Helion yeah. and our strategy there. So our first release with KVM will be focused on Helion. But uh, coming down the line, right, we're enabling uh, general support for KVM, and then we also, you know, also already support uh, hi, um, VMware, we already support Hyper-V, right, in terms of hypervisor. So that, that's the first key. Now, now that our VSA, our controller is uh, hypervisor agnostic, you can pretty much have it anywhere in your infrastructure, right, delivering data services for you, okay? So that's the first piece. And then the second piece after that is a technology that we put into the VSA. Uh, some of the things that we do that nobody does, things like our multi-site technology, for example, that's, um, that allows us to stretch a cluster across locations and uh, make your volumes pretty much look like they're local to uh, any one site, okay? We're the only ones that can really do that today with, uh, with the VSA effectively, and uh, our customers rave about that technology. So there's a lot of technology uh, uh, investment that goes into the VSA. So that multi-site stretch clustering, right. I mean, the, the, presumably the, the 
the, the hard part there is making everything consistent. That's correct. You're writing to multiple places. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Why is that so hard? Yeah, so the, the reason that's, um, that's, that's difficult is because one, you have a network in between, and so you have to deal with latencies, right? And then two, you have to make sure that the data is current between both sides, so that when you try to access it, at the time you're trying to access it, you know, you're getting the latest updated copy of that data. And so if you're familiar with the VSA in our architecture, um, what we do is we use network RAID and we're able to pretty much spread your blocks across multiple locations. And that's how we do, that's, that's pretty much the, the, the technology that's at the basis of being able to enable multi-site, okay? So we, we pretty much stress, uh, stretch your volume across two sites and we have replicated copies of uh, that data on both sides, okay? And so, as you're trying to access this data, you always have high availability, and the data is always there for you because um, of, of the underlying technology, our network rate technology. And I'm doing that at synchronous distance, obviously, right? That's correct. And That's it's correct. all done through software. That's correct, it's synchronous distances. Okay. Yeah, campus side. Talk about how Flash plays into this whole thing. So we, we currently support adaptive optimization, and, um, and this is where we're using Flash more as a tiering, um, as a tier of, of capacity. And uh, the interesting thing about our tiering technology is that um, we don't, like a lot of implementation that you've seen out there, we don't learn the customer data over a period of time and then make adjustments, okay? Our technology is able to ad uh, adaptively, pretty much on the fly, okay, look at the customer workload, look at the demand, and make sure that these hot blocks are dynamically moved into, into the, the flash capacity. And so that's the way we're using Flash today. And we, we're having a lot of discussions, because of our implementation, we're having a lot of discussion in engineering on how we can easily adapt you know, this implementation to uh, maybe using our Flash more as a, uh, as a cache, right, instead of a, just a storage tier. But the cool thing about this implementation of being a storage tier that's different than others is the, the, the Flash capacity actually is also storage. It's not just a cache. Right, that most implementation will say, this cannot be used for I.O., cannot be used for data. Actually, can you use it for I.O. but not for data? But we actually use, let you use that storage, that, that tier, that, that flash tier as storage capacity. Okay, so um, help me understand that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so if, if I'm using it as a, a tier, That's correct. Um, am I manually sort of allocating data to that tier or is it no. all dynamic? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's the beauty of it. So, we do provide recommendations to customers in terms of what percentage of flash they should have based on the capacity they're addressing. Typically 10 to 15 percent is, you know, is where you want to be at. But um, basically what happens then is as your data has happening on the storage node, okay, and every storage node would have you know, its tiers, so you could have two or three tiers, right? Depends on you, because we support multi-tiers. So imagine you had an environment where you had two tiers, a flash tier and a SAS tier and each one of the nodes in your environment would have the same configuration. And so what happens is as the data comes into that node, that node can figure out automatically which blocks are the hot blocks and will migrate those to the, uh, to the, uh, to the flash tier so that you can get um, better performance on those blocks. And as those blocks start cooling down and other blocks are heating up, we just swap um, access to uh, flash, flash storage. Now, in thinking about sort of the technology behind this. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could give us a little history here, because it, you know, like I say, a lot of marketing around software defined. Right. Uh, you guys have created this product well before right. sort of the marketing hit. Yeah. Where did it come from? Was the it VSA? A, yeah, was it, a, was it an effort to just sort of lower costs for mid-tier mid and smaller customers? Was it sort of observing technology trends, a little bit of both? I wonder if you could talk about so, that. So this is funny, I'll kind of uh, tell you a funny story, and this is uh, the, in, in inside jokes. But uh, as you know, our technology started with the appliance model, right? So we had this appliance right. model that would go out there and we would sell our technology embedded in it. And, um, and so one of the inside stories that uh, we tell a lot, and it's probably the first time people are going to hear about this uh, uh, live, is that uh, you, know, you have a whole bunch of marketing guys going on the road and uh, you know, demoing this stuff and wondering, it would be cool if I could demo this on my laptop. Because you know, VSA is really based on a, you know, Linux, underlying VSA runs a Linux operating system and we add all of our software on it. And so, next thing you know, they take that back to the lab and then a couple of people in the lab just starts, um, you know, a weekend project. And now they can run this demo that they want to take the customer on the laptop. And then, this goes on until the customer asks them one day, hey, this is what we want. We want, we want to be able to do that. Put that on anything that we want. And it's kind of like, 
you know, the unofficial birth of VSA, so to speak, right? So, so uh, <laughs> wow, that's, that is a cool story. It's a cool story, Okay, right? so then somebody said, wow, I can make a product out of this. And exactly, and then you realize you can make a product out of this, and you can put it on any server that's x86 based. Hey, sounds like a good story, yeah, so. So it's interesting, so as a technologist, you must, I mean, obviously you see what's going on at, at 3PAR inside HP, and they've got a, an ASIC, and that's correct. You know, of course, you know, CMAC will tell you, we don't want to build an ASIC, we do it because right. It's, right. it affords us advantages. So right. do you see, and so it's, it's clear at some point, right, that a lot of those functions are going to go into software, but, but do you see this as the future of, of, of storage? Uh, software defined? Yeah. Well, I mean, like Vish uh, mentioned in your segment, right, um, we're looking at the VSA as this software defined play for, you know, cost optimized environment, right? Uh, and then there's other things that you want to look at in terms of, um, you know, customer needs for other environments. But um, the VSA is definitely right now positioned within HP as our cost optimized, software defined story. Uh, we're putting a lot of resources behind it to try to make it easier to use, easier to deploy, and easier to consume, right? And so um, a lot of the work, like I mentioned to you in the beginning of our segment here, is, is pretty much going into abstracting the presence of a VSA itself. You know, I, Ideally, we wouldn't want you to think about a VSA there. We would want you to think about storage pool that you can dynamically provision and tear down as you need them. And so that's really where we're going. Abubakar, what do you make of, uh, of this notion? Because what you just described leads me to VVols, okay. right? Which is ultimately I want a pool of storage that I can you know, have uh, connect to sort of a, a VM, that's sort correct. of application view. That's great, that's great. Um, so what do you make of that trend? Uh, is it good news for you guys? Um, yeah, it's great news. Especially when a VSA environment for us, it's great news because one thing that block storage have been struggling with with VMware in general is that uh, VMware awareness. Okay, being able to look at a container and say, this is a virtual machine. Uh, file could do that, you know, NAS could do that before because all these VMs sit on the NAS of share, of file share as, as, as I mean, files pretty much, right? right. These, all these VMs. But with block storage, we see blocks. We understand, you know, uh, LVAs and, and that type of thing, right? Right, right, right? And so being able to see where a VM begins and ends is a little bit more difficult. And then being able to associate data services based on, based on those boundaries is a lot more difficult when you're at a LUN level. And so with VVols, we now finally have that capability with block storage where we can kind of look at uh, a VVOL and a VVM's definition and all the metadata that goes with it, and we know what a virtual machine now is, okay? And then we can uh, assign all bunch of data services to that virtual machine. We can enable QoS, we can enable stretch replication, we can enable snapshotting. I mean, there's a lot of things that we could do now uh, more effectively in the array at a virtual machine level, we weren't able to do before. By bubbling up those services and that's making correct. them available that's so correct. in the VVOL environment. And then, is, yeah, so and that's does, it, does that level the playing field then with sort of N NFS? Well, <laughs> Not only levels the playing field, but now I think it kind of really leaves it behind because if you look at some of the technologies that we have that you know they don't have, uh, we really kind of find, find finally are able to showcase the value of these technologies. Specifically, you're talking about the data services. Yeah, or? the data services, exactly. Mm. exactly yeah. All so right, uh, we're, all we're running out of time, Abu okay. Bakar, but so let's talk about uh, briefly OpenStack and and Helion. Okay. Uh, what the play is there? So, um, Helion is, as you know, this big. Um, OpenStack orchestration cloud uh, play that HP's got initiative that we have. And um, as part of that, the VSA, the KVM VSA that I mentioned that we've enabled specifically for HP Elion today is at the core of what um, Elion's going to deliver for the storage stack, right? For the, for the storage stack. So any customer that, cons you know, that um, consumes Elion and, and deploys it will have store virtual VSA and, and our um, Pretty much our API stack has been enabled with the um, OpenStack Cinder driver for all these iSCSI functionalities. So you want to deploy storage, you want to quickly provision uh, virtual machines, uh, meaning VSAs, all of the things will be uh, enabled through Elion, and uh, the VSA will be at the core of that. All right, and that's pretty fundamental to HP's yeah, cloud ex strategy. Exactly. Right? All right, Abubakar, the RA, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, it's a pleasure having you. Thank you, Dave. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest. We're live from VMworld 2014. This is theCUBE.